from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all, and welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for figurative sculptors and lovers of figurative sculpture all around the world. I am your host, Jason Arkels, a sculptor and educator living and working in Florence, Italy, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. And today, we're going to listen to an interview I did with Robert Bodum, the founding and current director of the Sculpture Department at the Florence Academy of Art here in Florence. Ever since I started the podcast two years ago, I knew that one of the interviews I had to conduct would be with Rob. A significant proportion of figurative sculptors who have trained and embarked upon their careers in the last two decades have had Rob as their instructor, and his personal aesthetic, as well as his teaching method, have influenced their work and I'm sure will continue to do so for many years to come. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Florence Academy of Art is one of the major teaching institutions worldwide for the training of artists in the so-called atelier tradition. Atelier is the word in French for studio, but today the phrase atelier tradition implies a style of training that concerns itself with painting, drawing, or sculpting the human figure, and that is passed from master to pupil directly, usually in the studios of working masters of the craft rather than in schools. Another way to put it is that it is similar to a conservatory style of education rather than a contemporary academic or university style education. Indeed, few ateliers are affiliated with contemporary academics so far as to be accredited to offer degrees, but the Florence Academy of Art is one of them. The Florence Academy of Art was founded by painter Daniel Graves in Florence in 1991. Starting off teaching in his own professional studio with just a handful of students, Graves has grown the Florence Academy of Art into one of the most recognizable academic brands the figurative tradition has these days. There are branches of the Florence Academy in Sweden and in the United States. And in Florence, after a series of several moves and expansions over the years, the original Florence Academy has just moved into a new studio. But to call the new property a mere studio is not really accurate. It's a studio complex a campus which rivals many small colleges I have seen in the United States, and it's complete with over a dozen teaching studios, a lecture hall, private faculty studios, a library, student lounge, art supply store, cafe, and visiting instructor residences, complete with their own private studios. It's enormous, and it's been outfitted seemingly with every convenience imaginable for the Academy's 150 or so students of painting, drawing, and sculpture. In early October... A week or so into the first academic year in the new space, I visited Robert Bodum in his studio's new home, taking the number 14 bus from the center of Florence to a few kilometers away, getting off at the bus stop newly named after the Florence Academy. Rob honored me with a tour before we sat down in his private studio to record the interview, and as I was setting up my recording equipment, I couldn't help but notice that, in addition to the Florence Academy being conveniently accessible by bus, Rob's private studio was convenient to another form of local transport. How often does that happen? Throughout my interview, you might hear some noticeable editing, or at least more noticeable than usual. And this is because Rob and I had to occasionally pause to let the train pass before continuing the interview. But you should know that, although the train sounds very close in the recording, I would have barely noticed had I not been conducting an interview and Rob Bodum's studio itself is delightful and comfortable. I hope you enjoy the interview as much as I did. So, Robert Bodum, thank you so much for joining me on The Sculptor's Funeral today. You're welcome. I want to get into talking about uh, your new uh, fantastic studio space that you have in Florence Academy Art, but first I want to uh, ask you a little bit about, about you. It's kind of funny, actually. When I was, when I was trying to figure out uh, sort of the order of the questions for this interview. I was thinking, okay, there's stuff about Rob, and there's stuff about Florence Academy of Art, mm-hmm. but at a certain point, it's almost impossible to separate the two because you've been here for 20 years. Yep, You've just been, about. Yeah. Can I ask you a little bit about uh, before and how you got, got into sculpting, how you first uh, started sculpting? Now, I know you went to Boston University yeah. for sculpture. Was that your first experience uh, in sculpture, or did you do it in high school? or? No, I actually, right out of high school, I went to Nazareth College, uh, which I was there for a year. And my goals at that point, because I had a very influential uh, high school art teacher who helped me a lot, was to be a high school art teacher. Hmm. So 
having expressed this to one of the faculty, like in midterm or mid-year there, she, I guess, thought my work was of quality enough that I should pursue being a professional artist, wow. not purely an educational uh, high school art teacher. So she encouraged me to leave and reset my goals. So, so at that point, I transferred to Boston University, uh, got involved in their core curriculum, which was sculpting, painting, uh, and drawing. Uh, thinking about the first sculpture I made, we didn't make any sculpture in high school, but my first sculpture was that freshman year at Nazareth College. And basically it was, you know, pouring a block of plaster and then carving it into whatever we wanted. My review of that sculpture was uh, the same teacher who encouraged me to leave and she looked at it and said, you're definitely a two-dimensional artist. <laughs> Ouch. So you were, but it was, it was an abstract shape that yeah. you were carving? It was totally abstract. And this was at Boston University, so they didn't have... No, a... it was at Nazareth before ah, I transferred. Okay. I see. And then at Boston, was there a, a figurative component to the... Yes. It, Boston University still had a somewhat traditional program at the time. So, you know, drawing, we had life drawing, we had life sculpting classes, we were painting from models, uh, painting from still lives, painting from, you know, white objects. Wow. Uh, uh, yeah. Was that a, is that something that's still going on now at no. Boston? That's, there's still an, a, a little element of that there. Uh, I'm not keeping in touch with Boston University so much, but... Last time I was there, it seemed like the sculpture program was turned into a ceramics program. Uh, a lot of the faculty that were traditional and painting realistically and sculpting realistically are gone. And they've been replaced with uh, conceptual artists and, and people who have different goals and ambitions for their students. Yeah. And there was that battle going on when I was a student there, and you, you felt it as a student. Who were, the, who were the figurative sculptors that you studied under at Boston? Uh, the principal one was Isabel Shedd, or... Isabel McElvain, she goes by two last names. Uh, she was a highly uh, realistic sculptor. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was studying with her. And, you know, we could choose. I, I chose to become a sculpture major because when I got my eyes checked as a sophomore in college, I they told me I was colorblind. Wow. I, I'd struggled a lot in, in the color theory classes. I couldn't really do a color wheel. Sitting in the painting room, I couldn't... Uh, you know, I was asking students next to me how to mix paint to achieve sort of a flesh tone. Uh, one day, I remember I was, they, they had these white objects that we were painting in a natural light, and the teacher had to point out on the second day of class that there, because it was natural light, there was a shade of blue in it, which I didn't see. I was mm -hmm. just looking at something that looked white to me. So I just took out ultramarine blue and put it in the white, and everything <laughs> turned baby blue. So I turned, told my teacher at the end of that year, I was colorblind, and uh, she gave me a B out of sympathy for the course, <laughs> and then I decided to become a sculpture major. Excellent. But a sculpture major for me was already more interesting. You know, I, I as an activity, as a 20-year-old, uh, you know, what I was doing in sculpture at the time, I was, you know, with a chainsaw and a tree trunk and wood chisels and welding, and uh, painting to me was always a little bit uh, less exciting as an activity. So I like the physical nature of, of sculpting and, and building and constructing. So it already grabbed me in as far as the activity of what was going on. So, yeah, that's how I became a sculpture major. So you, you got your, if I remember correctly, you got your, your undergraduate there in uh, 1995 and then your master's as well in 98? Yeah, yeah I, I, got my, I graduated in 1996 and then I took a year abroad and came to the Florence Academy of Art. How did you find out about the Florence Academy? Because I, I, I started studying in Florence in the mid-90s right around the same time. And I found it by accident. I wasn't even looking. Yeah, at this point, the Florence Academy of Art and these academies were obscure. You went, and without very much internet, one would have never heard of these places. Back in these days, there was, you know, 10, 12 students in, in these academies. And, uh, but I've known Daniel Graves since the age of six. So Daniel, Daniel Graves uh, is from the same town I'm from in New York. Oh, okay. So I've, I met his son uh, when I was on, he was on my soccer team. Uh, not my soccer team. He, we were on a soccer team together and got to know him. He became one of my best friends. And so I've known Daniel for, you know, a little less than 40 years at this point. Amazing. Okay. So I knew of his school, but I wasn't pursuing, uh, I, I wasn't pursuing in college academic work. I wasn't, I wasn't fully focused on the figure and I actually had more interest in doing more abstract work at the time. But I knew that my abstractions were quite gestural, and I knew the ideas of, for them were coming from having worked in the model room. So my thought to come to the Florence Academy of Art was, uh, before going to graduate school, was I was going to immerse myself in 
you know, academic study of the figure, if my ideas of abstraction were coming from working in model rooms, uh, immerse myself in that for a year, have an international experience, um, you know, studying abroad, and bring that back and go and pursue abstraction. And then I came to the Florence Academy of Art, and it was amazing. Uh, my year in Florence changed my, you know, what I wanted to pursue. And at that, at the end of the year, I made a commitment to the figure, and then a applied to Boston University with for, to go study with the woman I had studied with. And at that time, there was, you know, the choice of Boston University, but I was also looking into the New York Academy. Uh, this is for the grad? Graduate yeah, program. and there weren't, weren't many other area, places you could go where you could actually pursue uh, working with a figurative sculpture. I decided not to go to the New York Academy uh, because it seemed like a fairly, at that point, a, a pretty structured undergraduate program. There was a lot of classes you had to take and... Uh, I think in the first year you had to paint, you had to draw, felt a little bit like an intense undergraduate program. Whereas in Boston University, I was going to be giving a teaching assistantship right away. Uh, I was going to get a private studio and just to, to pursue my work. And that's what I felt uh, uh, graduate school was for. And that's what I wanted to do. So when you went to Florence Academy that first year, they didn't actually have a sculpture department. At, at that point, they, they referred to it as a year of a visiting artist. They had Cessna Di Cosimo, who was a sculptor, extremely talented individual, who was working here at the time. And uh, so Cessna was working here. I was sculpting half a day with Cessna, and I was drawing half a day. You were just sculpting just alongside a Cessna? Yeah, yeah. We were in the back room in Casine. It wouldn't be unlike. It was facilitated as if this sculpture program, everyone was working in this studio. So it was challenging, you know, Cessna was, got, had the studios to himself in the afternoons and all his work was in there and then you came in in the morning and worked with him and had to worry about not knocking over his sculpture. So was, Were there other students also studying sculpture? Uh, uh, or was it just There the was uh, like two or three. Huh, interesting. I, I, I had always thought that you actually instituted the sculpture department. and I, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I guess you did uh, eventually in, I think, 98. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So Cessna left the year I left, so that was the end of 96, or maybe at that point, 97. Uh, and the sculpture program ceased to exist. I'm not sure if even the intention, I wasn't even asking the questions back then, uh, if, if it was meant to be a sculpture program, or if, you know, I'm not even sure what happened to it. I just know that it wasn't facilitated, there was no space for it. Uh, and to be honest with you, there were probably no students. So the year I left, you know, I was the one who was here, you know, trying to pursue sculpting, and I left, and, you know, maybe there just wasn't a student to teach anymore back then. Right. So you went back to Boston, uh, did the graduate program, and who, who was the woman you started with? Isabel from... McElveen. Isabel oh, okay. She, she was also your undergraduate. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. And that's what I think a lot of people are looking for in a graduate program. They're looking for a specific instructor yeah. uh, that they feel that they can, you know, glean the things off of them that they need. Yeah, uh, I always tell students, don't look at the school, look at who's going to be teaching exactly. you when you're there. Uh, you, you got, so you got your master's degree in Boston. Yes. Yeah. What, how did it, how did it come about that you came back to Florence Academy, uh, to eventually start up the, the sculpture department there? Well, as I was coming into my thesis project, and then that was going to mark the end of my graduate program, uh, preparing my th thesis show and not knowing what to do, you know, as everyone in the arts might think, well, I'm going to go and like turn my parents' garage into a studio, uh, and a couple of things happened. I, there was an etching professor uh, who came to me and said, Rob, they're looking for a professor for Amherst College, uh, which is, you know, 40, 40 minutes away from Boston. So I set up an interview and I went down there and uh, was eventually hired to, to work at uh, Amherst College to introduce a figurative sculpture program. Oh, wow. At the same time, I... As you know, for so many people that come to Florence, Italy, that the minute you leave it, you can't stop thinking about it. So what I wanted to do was come back to Florence. And, you know, I wrote Dan a fax. And I said, listen. <laughs> that, and that dates you? He actually, he actually gave it to me on my wedding day. He still had it. So, wow. And it basically said I'm available. I had no commitments. I had uh, the world in front of me, choices that I, you know, to do whatever I was hoping to do. And... You know, at that point, uh, I said, Daniel, if you want a serious sculpture program, I'm ready to come over there and, and get that set up. Daniel's a big, uh, is very passionate about sculpture. 
And incidentally, there, he was in the States at the time. I guess the board of directors that was financially responsible for the Florence Academy of Art wasn't willing to expand. Hmm. So if I, don't, if I didn't get this wrong, I think Daniel uh, got rid of all of them and decided to move forward with it anyway. And that was the first expansion of the Florence Academy of Art. So it was always Via della Cazine. And the first expansion that the Florence Academy of Art went through was introducing sculpture and Via Luna. Wow. That was the first time... Dan had multiple studios. Yes. Yeah. And they it eventually grew to what, like five different studios at the same time? Yes. That's what you're dealing with? Amazing. Yeah. And what helped this happen was I also received a uh, uh, what seemed like a lot of money at the time. It was a $10,000 grant from Boston University. I won the Khan Award. So having won the Khan Award uh, for my graduate work, I was coming here financially with, without much worries. And... Uh, yeah, that was you know, in the 90s, too, when 10,000 10, American dollars yeah. versus the lira. No, you lived like a king back yeah, then. Yeah, you did. So that, you know, that helped me, you know, gave me peace of mind uh, knowing what the Florence Academy of Art was, was running on. And like back then, uh, you know, also Daniel and Susan, you know, some peace of mind. So we had, we had some leeway there. Great. Yeah, and, so yeah. if it didn't work out, no harm. Yeah, getting things set up. And, yeah. So I came over here. I started with one student, you know, eventually. You know, and then eventually two, and then three, and then uh, six, and then eight. And, you know, at that point, we were housing also an intensive one-year drawing program in Via Luna. So the sculpture program, as we started, was one of the rooms there. Then as I got four students, we took over another room. And then as I got six students, another room. And eventually, we took over the building. Then the school needed to expand into Via Fratelli Bandiata to then put the students in the painting program, which was growing at the same time as well and then eventually Porta Romana. So there were four principal buildings uh, at the Florence Academy of Art. Until this year, until about two weeks ago. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And we still have some of those buildings. The school decided, and I think it's a, it was a great idea, we've done workshops in July, and mm -hmm. there's people from around the world that would like to come to Florence and study. I think a month sometimes is a long time to, de to dedicate to a uh, study for some people if they you know, have a job and a, full and a family somewhere else. And also people come to the summer courses and they, they have a hard time dealing with the heat. Mm. So what they've done, the Florence Academy of Art has opened up workshops throughout the year. So people can organize themselves better, uh, maybe, you know, have more flexibility with that. Well, I can do something for three weeks or four weeks in, in February, but not in July. And I would much rather be in Florence in February than dealing with the heat of July. Yeah. It's so, interesting in these expansions that the sculpture program has been through because we moved four years ago to... A larger studio and I remember you know people often that know me particularly Daniel they think I get quite comfortable or, or see me quite comfortable in my surroundings and then don't think that I'm ever going to want to move and so Daniel's phone call to me when they thought that they, they could move the sculpture program to improve it was uh, he, I don't think he thought that I was going to be willing to move and he says to me very hesitantly, well, maybe there's an idea that we could potentially move the sculpture program. I said, Daniel, if it's going to improve my program, I'm, I'll be happy to move. Yeah, yeah. And then here as well, we, you know, Bruchato was a nice studio, but I was more than happy to leave it and, and move over here. Well, you have the studio you have here. You just gave me a tour uh, 20 minutes ago, and I've never seen a figurative arts studio. But this fa facility just, I think, is just, there's just so much you can do with it. I mean, it just seems like it has infinite potential. Yeah. So, what are the what are the um, what are the real sort of uh, real world advantages to um, that that the studio has over the over Palazzo Bruciato? Well, Palazzo Bruciato, even though it was a fairly large building, there were still limitations to the size of the studios based upon where pillars might have been in the. And essentially, we had three modeling studios in the old studio, which. Because I'm running a three-year program and it's continued enrollment, so I can accept one or two students if there's space in the winter term. But what I come up with is a mixture of students that are in varieties of places in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I was able to design four modeling studios here, uh, having more space, which means that gives me more flexibility to put people uh, in an appropriate spot, uh, that, in an appropriate group. The other, the other big advantage was that I was able to actually build uh, or build a laboratory, which was going to adjust the curriculum here. So that's getting started right now. We're, in, we're introducing uh, a foundry course, and on multiple levels, it's helping everything. One of which is I've never quite had space for a, a third-year student to sculpt full-time, and that meant that they are 
uh, for the past 18 years, basically studying drawing for three years, which, you know, drawing is, is never uh, a bad thing to be doing for a lifetime, but I think that the sculpture students should be focusing on in their third year in full-time sculpture. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the intention when I came here. I thought a drawing program uh, would be about two years and just have never had the opportunity to introduce something new uh, to allow them to study full-time sculpting. So that's one of the advantages. The, the sculpture students are sculpting full-time now in their third year. The other advantage is that the preparatory exercises which I've designed for the course, which they'll do in the first term, are meant to be exercises that they will help them develop their final project. So, you know, there's a lot of, in the curriculum, a, a student, we touch on portraiture in the beginning as class projects. I expect students to take an interest in it and keep pursuing it for throughout their time here. Some do, some don't. Uh, those that don't may come to their final project and have only maybe produced one or two portraits. And at that point, they'd be fairly competent working between the pit of the neck and the ankles, and then uh, maybe not quite uh, get the head to work up there, and that's an unfortunate thing. So, th so in the begin, the assignments that they're going to do to prepare for the life size, they'll be doing portrait studies, they'll be doing maquettes uh, to develop ideas for their final project, and they'll they'll be doing hand and feet studies uh, that they can cast from life. So, there's multiple advantages. First of all, I'm able to design, uh, you know, further the sculpture curriculum for the needs of certain students to help their final project to help their abilities for their final project. The next thing that it affords people is to learn about how to, the process of bronze. It's something my students naturally gravitate towards. It's not something that I recommend for them necessarily. Uh, but as you know, in Italy, there's a lot of availability of foundries. You can throw a tennis ball and hit three of them in Florence. So my students need to walk into a foundry and know the right questions to ask. They know what they, right. they, know what they need to expect because, you know, they're... They're competent sculptors, maybe in their third year, and they're able to probably evolve a clay to a level that is professional. Then they got to see that metal, and then they got to know what to expect, and then they can't go to a foundry without having any idea what's going on there, and then ask questions that are, you know, the foundry is not capable of even doing. One of my first founders told me, you know, sculpture is born in clay, it dies in plaster, and it's reborn in bronze. And I, I, I do think that as you're dealing with a bronze, you know, you're, you're through the clay, the clay's destroyed, and you got to uh, get it to work in a new material. So I'm, I'm happy to introduce this to my students. It's also because we're able to supply, have facilities for them to do a majority of the work with the exception of the pour itself. The, the casting costs, the foundry costs, are going to be greatly reduced. Right, so the new facility has the capacity to do wax. It has the capacity to make molds and produce the waxes and, and chase the bronze all, all exactly. the house. Right, that's yeah. great. And that's, that's great because, like, you know, that's, that's something that everybody learns eventually, I mean, you know, who go into this, but they always have to learn it outside of school on their own time and usually at their own expense where, you know, you're getting your first bronze done and it's not coming out right because you have no idea of how to control the, uh, the, the, the steps of the process, either by doing it yourself or just by supervising those. Yeah, doing. and, you know, I, I've learned a lot from working with foundries in Italy is that, like so many things that, you know, they don't often want you to see the poor right out of the, the investment. They, if there's a mistake that might have happened, they would kind of want to try to t touch that up before you come by. And I can understand that. And then you, they'll go and you'll look at your fingernails and you're going, wait a second here. Yeah. This isn't what I sculpted. There is this constant sort of, you know, you got to check and you got to understand. And you got to understand what's going on. So I'm... Uh, you know, it's not like you pour bronze, it just comes out perfectly every time. So there's mistakes that happen in the process and that will affect your work. And you got to know, you got to look for it, and you got to know how to deal with it. The other thing is that I, myself, uh, produce probably, I, I make molds that aren't, that are more foundry grade molds, that are a little bit more air free than maybe some of the students that have been mold, mold making throughout the years here. So it's another thing that I'm going to be trying to help, trying to show them is how to make a, maybe a more suitable mold that can be used by a foundry uh, that's a little bit more air-free, that's mm -hmm. harder for the foundry to screw something up in. And I've even found, you know, foundries here, the commercial foundries, they're, if they're even producing your molds, it's, it's per hour they're being paid. So they're still trying to get things done quickly. Whereas I'll take a little bit more time to go to, to, to produce a mold than even a mold maker at a foundry will here. But once again, it'll be air-free. And so the thing you learn as a founder or as, you know, producing bronzes, 
you've done the sculpture in clay. You may have produced a gesso of it. You uh, will produce the first edition wax. Then you'll go in and work on that wax. Then you'll, it'll come out in bronze, and then you're touching up that bronze. Uh, and then you go into the second edition, and you're touching up the wax, and then you're touching up the second edition bronze. Then you go into the third edition, you're remaking and touching and dealing with things. Uh, and I personally don't like that so much. It's like remaking the sculpture over and over again. I like my, my molds to be fairly uh, foolproof so that, they, that there's really not much work to do already on the wax. Right, right, right. So I like to, a mistake in the mold means every wax you make will have that same mistake. It needs to be yeah. fixed each and every time yeah. individually. And if you're letting a founder pour the waxes and they're not being careful. And, yeah. We'll hear more of my interview with Robert Bodum when the sculptor's funeral continues. Well, well, it's back to school season around the world, which means it's time for both teachers and students to stock up on clay, armature wire, modeling tools, and all the rest. And if you are a regular listener to the show, you already know where you need to go to get all your kit, and that is Blick Art Supplies. Blick Art Supplies, the oldest and largest provider of art supplies in the United States, who ship their quality products around the world. Their superior customer service, extensive selection, and competitive prices make them the choice for professional and amateur artists, art educators, architects, designers, students, and hobbyists. Virtually anyone requiring quality art materials for work or for pleasure. And you know, there isn't another art supplier on the web with as many products and materials specifically for sculptors than Blick. Over 70,000 products for artists of all types, and you can get everything you need, from dozens of different clays and plasters, to fine Italian marble carving tools, clay modeling tools, specialty casting mediums, waxes, body casting supplies, turntables, armatures, books on sculpture. Basically, if you need it for sculpture, they have it. And shipping is free in the United States on most items if your order is more than $100. And that's nothing to sneeze at if you're running a workshop and you need to provide materials for a dozen students. But Blick is not merely a place just to buy stuff. They also have product information specialists, trained to hunt down answers to your tough questions regarding materials, techniques, and safety. Hundreds of how-to videos are also available at dickblick.com and on their YouTube channel, including video lesson plans for teachers and product demonstrations. So, if you're making a rubber mold, for instance, and you need a few pointers, they'll help you out, not just with their online tutorials, but if you call them up, you can actually speak to a living being who knows how to answer your question. So that's, that's Blick Art Supplies, right? And it's great. But let me tell you about how the Sculptor's Funeral fits in and why I promote Blick on the Sculptor's Funeral podcast. You see, by buying your art supplies from Blick, you can contribute directly to the support of the Sculptor's Funeral. All you need to do is this. You go to the Sculptor's Funeral website, www.thesculptorsfuneral.com, and click on any of the Blick Art Supplies banner links that you'll see there. And that link will take you right to the Blick website where you can buy whatever you need. It's that simple. But just remember, you need to click through a link at thesculptorsfuneral.com first so that Blick knows I sent you. And when you do that, Blick gives the Sculptor's Funeral a small percentage from your total bill. It's kind of like you get a discount, which you then donate in support of the show. Now, you're paying what you would normally pay at Blick. You're not getting charged extra. But by using the link at thesculptorsfuneral.com, a little something trickles down to the podcast. So the next time you stock up on armature wire, mold rubber, modeling tools, and plastilina, do it in a way that supports the only podcast out there devoted to the global community of figurative sculptors. Go to thesculptorsfuneral.com, click on Blake, and support the show. And thank you. Can I talk a little bit about your, uh, your, your modeling technique that you teach and that you practice in your own work? Of course. Uh, yeah, drawing in space. This is something that you yourself uh, evolved. I think it's probably the best word for it. Uh, it's can, can you uh, just kind of give an overview in terms of uh, what kind of technique it is? Well, I'd first say that it's you know it's something I've looked after, and I guess as the director, I, you could say that I evolved it, but it's it's evolved over the needs of having worked with hundreds of students and paying attention to their needs and listening to their questions uh, over the years. So it's, it's been a, something I'm guiding, but it's, it's, it's changes in its evolution is happening, not just by me sitting in my studio by myself, but 
the experience that I have with different students at different times and their different needs and their different struggles. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a constantly evolving uh, curriculum, which is, I think, one of my main jobs here is to uh, tweak that as, until it's foolproof in some ways. Because I think that drawing in space, at least today, what I think it offers, it can take someone with no experience and bring them very far. It can take someone who has a, a, deal, a certain amount of talent and take them farther. And it can, it, it, it can take a professional sculptor also a certain distance. Uh, so I think it, it's a curriculum that I think so many people can benefit from, no matter kind of where you're at in the spectrum of, of your level. So that's what I really like about it. it. There's something in it for everyone. Let's put it that way. Okay. The first year is me introducing students to drawing in space and the techniques and procedures of it, because it involves specific ways in which one reads a figure and a portrait for that matter. It involves techniques to render with. And uh, so what I'm trying to do in the beginning is introduce students to this curriculum, the, the procedures and techniques of it, so that throughout their first year, it, I'm telling them to not worry so much about their results, but the focus of this first year to come at it with a competent understanding of the procedures and techniques. And there are a lot of them. The second year then is with a student having learned the procedures and techniques, then we start blowing up the work and making it larger, and then we start focusing on finish by modeling life-size torsos. Uh, so a student's coming out of their second year, they have a competent understanding of drawing in space, they have a fairly competent ability to render and resolve their work, and in their third year, the assignments get a little bit more creative as they're being more responsible for you know, posing the model, choosing the model, uh, there's certain designations like a three-quarter reclining pose that I'm introducing to them at the beginning of their third year. Uh, it's a new scale that they haven't worked with yet at that time, and it's a challenge, and the reclining figure is a, a new challenge that they haven't maybe addressed yet either. So there's things they are pulling out of that assignment that are furthering their, their abilities as a sculptor. Then they do some more creative assignments where we do a lot of cropping. I mean, the torsos are cropped naturally because we're not rendering below the knee or you know, into the arm necessarily or the head, but uh, so they're made, they're learning about cropping and how to compose with their torsos. And this assignment after the three quarter reclining figure is a continuation of that. It's a life size male figure that they can once again pose whatever choice they want to make with the pose, and it's it can be cropped. Some people may push it to become a a full life size. Uh, that happened last year, and that's the precursor. Then then their final project is their 10-week life-size project, full mm -hmm. figure. Right. Life-size directly from life. Yeah. Using a live model. Yeah. Yes. Not enlarging from a small scale. No. Perfect. And 10 weeks can be a challenging time to produce a life-size model or a life-size sculpture, especially if you're headed off in the wrong direction at any moment. Because as you're headed off in the wrong direction, at any moment you're, you're, you're chewing up weeks to, to go backwards and reclaim sort of what you're, you, you've not understood or developed not so well. A lot of people learn about, you know, pace here, you know, pacing yourself. You know, 10 weeks is way too much time for a beginner student to know anything to do with. And sometimes 10 weeks then isn't enough for third year students here. Right. Then the, the final life size, I like to take them back to something that's a little bit more familiar, which is a standing figure and go back to the contraposto because I, I, I want them to have a familiarity with the pose and the, that I don't want to introduce distinct new challenges that they haven't uh, encountered yet as a sculptor here so that you know, even though if that 10 weeks is going to be challenging for time, at least the, the subject matter or the way in which it's studied is more familiar. Can I ask you just what, what is drawing in space? Can you, can you define it or describe it even maybe relative to uh, another, uh, another methodology? For instance, like the, the, the egg and box? I would say it's more related to egg crochet. Not that it's an anatomical approach to studying the figure, but it's a constructive approach. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the primary intention of drawing in space is to focus on the internal core of the human body. My teacher taught me that all good figurative sculpture has a sense of internalness. This is where the basis of drawing in space uh, comes from. So the focus is the trunk of the body. The, we call it the box and the egg, which is the pelvis and the rib, rib cage combined with the spinal column. That's where the sculpture starts. That's where a student is meant to introduce these elements of structure understand how they work together, understand how they don't work together, understand what it means to have a broken spinal column. And the spinal column itself and the pelvis itself then becomes the origin of decision-making. 
So when a student's introducing the box to represent the pelvic tip or the pelvic region, it's also establishing a first true proportion in the work because at that point, if they've set up the tip of the pelvis well, the distance between their pelvic points and the bottom of their feet uh, don't change. So it's a given length of proportion in their work. So once you get the, so if I'm understanding you right, once you get the, the sort of proportion of the box of the pelvis, that is sort of your given point from which you develop the proportions of the rest of the figure? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you, you are aware that my students don't measure. They'll start measuring when they get more into life size, but the half scale figures aren't measured. They're meant to, the students are meant to intuitively work through the proportional base, but there is that establishment. Okay, so when you say measure, you mean measure off the model and then translate? Yeah, the students don't use calipers to, to right. measure off the model. Right, and the but they do, they do check ratios in, in their clay models. That's the yeah, way. they do comparative measuring, but taking away a student, uh, you know, the use of measurement to develop these studies, uh, I'm giving them a standard of proportion that they can judge things off of. So if a, if a student is developing a, a length that you're not calling into question, once it's established, all you're trying to apply to that figure is a width. So that's where then, you know, we're also trying to instruct people to construct a figure from in, inside to outside. So when you're just dealing with that width, you know, once you get quite competent with this, you can create a lot of tension between the inner core of your rib cage and pelvis if you're building out to create that sense of internalness that I was mentioning to you earlier. So when you use this system along with live models, does that mean, it, does that kind of limit you uh, in terms of the, the choice of model, for instance, I imagine you wouldn't want someone whose body proportions are wildly different from the proportional standard that you're you're instilling, for instance. Well, the the placement of the pelvis on the on the armature is uh, there's an area where you should set it. So, for example, the the advantage actually is is that depending on where you place the pelvis, which is defining the length of your legs, you can be working in different scales. So what happens, for example, if a tall model comes in and you place their pelvis too low, your figure is going to be quite small. If you have a short model coming in and you place the pelvis quite high, uh -huh. you're going to be winding up with a very large scale study. So actually, you study different ratios. The encouragement, you know, you know as a sculptor that it's easier to work life size than it is, you know, a smaller scale where spaces get smaller, modeling gets harder. Uh, so I encourage people to kind of set up the pelvis quite high so that the scale of their figure is, is going to be large enough for them to manage, you know, when they, when they get into the fifth week and get into smaller little ribs and stuff like that. Right, right. But no, it's the model, the model's proportions uh, don't, don't affect the process, meaning it's... Right, right. You, you adapt the model to the, the preset proportion rather than try to actually imitate the model's proportion. Well, they are working with the model's proportions, but... There, there's a the pole that's holding the armature. They're they're establishing the pelvis there. So uh -huh. you know you're talking about placing a pelvis, and I'm no one can see this obviously, but <laughs> yeah, uh, Rob is holding up his hands right now. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you you place the pelvis a little bit higher, a little bit lower. That's uh -huh. the length, and then okay. you're then applying the, the the torso to it. But right, 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 right. There's but, not predetermined proportions on the armature itself. There's the length of the aluminum on the armature, which we can extend. If if they're running out of room to maybe you know evolve you know put the head on there right, right. we'll we'll just you know right. extend the the length of the neck or something right no I was just talking about the the width of the pelvis versus the the height to or I guess the depth to the floor from the pelvis you were talking about where students run into problems with proportions is is and in drawing in space in the manual this happened while I was developing that sculpture is that I, the torso became too long for the legs. So once I recognized that in the manual, and I think that that's another thing that I was happy to insert uh, in that manual, that this is a flawed process, that you know, sculpting is a flawed process, painting is a flawed process. You make mistakes and you have to edit it and you have to find it. So I was happy to include the mistake, the large mistake that the proportions of the figure weren't working out well. Yeah, and you run out of room. There's there's a base of clay that's underneath the feet, so if you needed to drop the feet, which is one of the ways in which I troubleshot this in the manual or describe how to work through it, so I raised the pelvis a little bit more and I dropped the feet a little bit to extend the length of the legs. Rather than shorten yeah. the torso, right. But, you know, a student that's, you know, learning this process, the, they're setting, they're not making a pelvis and then legs. They're trying to, as best they can, evolve the figure together, but they're, uh, the legs 
are becoming more resolved in the torso first, meaning they, they need that to see that proportional base. They need to establish those widths a little bit more specifically uh, first in, in the sculpture. That's the construction method. They're, they're, that's the way in which we read figures. That's the procedure in which they're learning. So, you know, they do two or three or four or five. They're getting pretty used to it. And so, yeah, they're from literally their second term here until the, they're done with their sixth term. They're doing a lot of standing figures. A lot of the adjustments to this program have come based more on time that a student is putting into their work. So over the years, I've reducing more and more and more the amount of time a beginner student here is dealing with a project. So as I'm introducing this method to people, they're doing one week studies and then tossing them. Yeah, that's, that's actually interesting because that's what uh, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts would do in their, in their first year uh, of uh, figure modeling is they would start a new project every Monday, trash it on Friday yeah. in the first year. Yeah, I think it's always my biggest struggle as a teacher. I've worked with a lot of students up to this point, and I find that when a beginner student comes here, what they're really, you know, and I always think about what's, what am I capable of and why am I able to uh, critique their work and, and, you know, why they're not. You know, this is a question I think a lot about, and of course experience has a lot to do with it, but it's not the only thing. I don't think it's because I see better, uh, but I, I think it comes down to editing. A beginner student here doesn't really know how to edit their work. And they become, oh, here's a contour that seems to kind of work, and they, they are comfortable with it and move on. Instead of thinking, well, the knee's got to raise and lower, the thigh's got to come out, the great trochanter has to do this. What I didn't mention, I, I'd like to say, because I say this to all the students as they first come here, and I would have probably inserted this in when you asked me about the beginning. What happened to me when I came here was I was coming from Boston. I felt fairly comfortable, at least at that point, of making a sculpture. But... I was coming to the Florence Academy of Art trying to start a sculpture program, and what I was realizing when I got here, I mean, I already knew this, is they have a world-class drawing and painting program. And I was introducing a sculpture program. I didn't have a lot of teaching experience, but I needed to get my students who would eventually find me and come and study with me to that level, and I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed with uh, what, I, what I need to do, uh, and I was realizing... Uh, a lot of things that I didn't know, you know, at this point in time. And so in the beginning, I would, you know, even have students that came here that had more experience than I did. So my first years here were uh, quite tense in many ways. And what grew out of that was kind of the philosophy now with which I guide this program and have since then, which is it's my job to teach my students not to need me. If not my, to need you. Not to need me. If my students leave this academy and they rely on me making their figure because I'm critiquing it, I failed. So that has guided the decision making and all the evolution of this program and that as I think about it more and more and think about you know what students need you know generally the first year students the second year students and the third year students they're even though they're all individuals and being guided as individuals you know it's pretty consistent with what happens here now and what happens here we're just as I was just mentioning is that a beginning student first of all doesn't know the curriculum and doesn't know how to read and doesn't maybe know some of the procedures and techniques so they're being introduced to that uh, but what I'm really realizing is I talk to my students, a critique here with me is a discussion. And it starts with how you're doing. And I'm expecting students, when I first ask that question, uh, they tell me, I'm doing good, how are you, sir? Or maestro. <laughs> I say, no, no, how's your work going? And in the beginning, they, they can't really answer that question. Once they realize that I'm going to ask that question every time I see them, they go, okay, well, Rob's a asking me to, to critique my work. And then they start trying and they're way off. They, they are shooting, you know, they're shooting blanks. Let's put it that way. Right, they're they're right. saying things about sculpture that have, you know, that has little to do with what their sculpture needs. But that's a really interesting technique in terms of your teaching because that means when they know you're coming around, they know they have to start looking at their work and figuring be out. Be self-aware. Yeah, be self-aware because it's being demanded of them. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny because, you, you know, they're doing it because they know you're going to ask. But the reason you're asking is to is is to instill in them the habit of looking at their work and, and critiquing yeah, it. And and the discussion that they need to have in their head. And that's what we're discussing with them. And I don't give that's my great. students the answers. I expect them through the discussion I'm gonna have with them to to direct them to the answers, but I don't wanna I don't want to just tell them do this and do that and do that and you're and if you do that your sculpture will be better and I'll see you next week. Right. A laundry list of things to yeah. correct and then yeah. 
And I've found that there's, you know, kind of two ways to teach this process, whether it's painting, drawing, or sculpture. It's you tell someone how to improve the work that's in front of you, or you improve their abilities as a sculptor, painter, or draftsman. Knowing I need to teach my students not to need me, and I want them to be working professionals in the field because they represent me at that point, and that's the most crucial thing for a successful program. Not me making sculpture, but my alumni out there making sculpture. And right. so that's very important for me. And that all starts on day one, and it starts in peculiar ways because I'm expecting my students to try to answer those questions. And what I find is they're unable to in the beginning. And then as you do this over and over again, and they're, this is happening to them, probably with all the faculty, but with me twice a week, in their second year, they're critiquing their work and they're, they're on base. You know, they're generally analyzing it well. In a third year, when I'm discussing with a student and asking that question, they almost give their sculpture a thorough critique. And I say, I don't have anything to add to that. And then I realize I'm starting to achieve my goals, which is to teach them not to need me. How different is uh, the general technique uh, that you teach here? How is it different from what you learned in Boston? What I learned in Boston was the box and the egg. Mm -hmm. and, but, that's, but, you, you, but the box and egg is where you start with uh, drawing in space as yeah. well. So basically what I was learning in Boston was how to start a sculpture. I was critiqued seemingly for six years on the box and, my, on the box and egg of my sculpture. And it seemed to me that I was being told why it's wrong to the point where when I was two weeks away from finishing my graduate sculptures that I needed to cast for the, the thesis show, I, I just didn't want to critique anymore. I didn't want to be told my box and egg wasn't, wasn't working well. I wanted to talk about how to model and how to make hair and what to do with the hands. And I, there was a lot I wasn't getting, you know, it was kind of just how it worked there. But, uh, you know, it's also the thing for me, you know, when you're a teacher of the subject, and this might have been what's happening, you know, you're so sound with something, you can always find it, you can always find it as a problem in someone's work. So if you walk up to a student's sculpture and only want to discuss proportions, you'll always find a proportion wrong. So if you just go keep going do that, you can, you can become overly repetitive to a point where, you know, if you do this for two years in a row, no one's going to be paying attention anymore. And that's kind of what happened to me in Boston. Uh, maybe my box and egg wasn't working. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, going to spend my life hopefully <laughs> thinking about it and focused on it. And, but I knew there was more to sculpture that I wasn't getting. So it was frustrating, actually. So, so drawing space is really developing, developing what you learned, you know, in Boston, uh, sort of filling in the gaps of the education that you got there. Yeah, you know, it's drawing space start with the box starts with the box and egg and that's what I felt I had learned in Boston and to be honest with you was I was starting to teach it uh, or my understanding of it at the time and more focused on how the body works and moves together uh, I understood it better now you mentioned that uh, you know you, you came you came to you come to Florence to start up the the sculpture department in a school that was starting to get a fantastic reputation for producing world-class draftsmen and, and painters. Mm -hmm. How did Dan Graves uh, and, and what he teaches at the Florence Academy in the painting and drawing departments, how did that affect your evolution of drawing in space, or did it? Well, the, the template for the curriculum that I started with was based upon what they were doing here. So I had similar assignments, sculptural, that were coinciding with kind of how a drawing and painting student uh, was, was working here. So you know, the painting program was my template for how to set up a program. Right. But did, did the um, processes or uh, philosophies and practices of how uh, the painters painted um, uh, affect how, uh, how sculpture Well, definitely. Was definitely. Yeah. I think, first of all, drawing. Mm -hmm. Drawing is uh, a huge thing that some sculptors like to neglect. And there is more drawing decisions to make in a three-dimensional figure than there is on a piece of paper. So in some cases, a, a sculptor student has to be more of a sound draftsman than maybe even a painter, as lightning strikes. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not talking about a painting. I think there's, you go into the values in the chroma and all of color, there's millions of decisions painters are dealing with. But there are so many drawing decisions to be made on a sculpture that the sculpture students here are getting a very sound uh, curriculum and what the drawing curriculum even and that's as 
it's been going through adjustments, how a sculptor here studies drawing, more rooted into the changes that the curriculum here have gone through over the years, whereas the drawing program at the Forest County Mart has changed, but not maybe to how the sculpture curriculum has changed. So we're, we're starting to evolve based on that brief assignments that I was mentioning to you. Mm -hmm. That, you know, a sculpture student in the past, you know, their second week of school, their first term, they'd be starting a five-week charcoal pose. And yet again, I just think a first semester student in their second week of school, to me, has no business doing a five-week long pose. So now the students in the sculpture are, are doing a series of one-week poses. They're drawing in pen very early on. Wow, So they're really? doing some, pen? yeah. Huh. Why? Because the editing that they don't understand needs to happen to their work yet is left there as an archaeological. They can't um, erase. Yeah. Right. So, and that's what a student, you know, can come out with as an expectation. Wow, look at how many times I had to adjust this line. Oh, nice. I never thought that you actually had to do it that many times. And you adjust that line until it works. Hmm. And if that takes five attempts, seven attempts, eight attempts, you know, uh, the point of it isn't to try to do a, a good drawing. The point of it is to have an expectation of the process. Right. That when they're in that model room, the amount of decisions that they need to make. And I'd say that too, is that, the, you know, this thought comes out of the old cliche you hear from a lot of people that I probably said a thousand times, but I don't believe in anymore, which is you come to a school like this and you train your eye. And I, I think it's more of a training of the mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. I say yeah. the same thing. You know, a sculptor doesn't have good hands. They have a good mind that controls their eyes and controls their hands. But I think an interesting thing about this, I mean, the, there's been, you know, a 18 year struggle. The sculpture students coming here, they used to refer to their drawing in a 19th century academic way which is a way in which a painter trains. As they become aware of this and they say, well, I'm not drawing like a sculptor. They are studying here, my sculpture students, a 19th century approach to academic drawing that is for a painter, uh, that is how a painter is trained. I have no idea how, if sculpture students that they had called the Beaux-Arts drew differently than the painters. They may have, they may have not. No, they were all actually in the same classes. Okay, yeah. so they were. Uh, Sculpture students would come here and they want to draw like Michelangelo, which is in a 19th century approach to, to drawing. Yeah, it's also a fresco approach to drawing, right. really. And they go, why am I charcoal painting, they call it. <laughs> they call it charcoal painting. And I've had these conversations over and over and over again. They don't think they should be doing it. They don't think they should be doing it. Turns out a lot of those people I've had conversations with are back at home somewhere in America teaching drawing classes at <laughs> universities because they're really good at it. Yeah. Something that I think is crucial, if someone said to me, or if this was a question that you're going to ask and I'll preempt it, was, you know, I think that the Florence County Art Sculpture Program is recognized today as someone that gets very consistent results, if not even evolves and improves. Uh, and if someone said, what do you think the reason for that is? I would say I would give a lot of uh, credit to the, the drawing curriculum. Yet again, something I've thought a lot about is that a sculpture student's going to come here and learn a very sound way to sculpt while they're learning to think like a painter. And a lot of sculptors would want to neglect that and say, well, I'm just a sculptor and I'm just going to, you know, not worry about what a painter thinks about. But I think that there's the idea of soft edges and focal points and a lot of things that painters are, are composing with and working with uh, is really crucial to sculpture. The instruction one receives from Robert Bodum at the Florence Academy goes beyond how to sculpt a figure in clay and addresses questions of why we model figures. And we'll hear all about it from Rob when the sculptor's funeral continues. Okay, everybody, it's that part of the podcast where I try to sell you on a workshop that I'm giving or, or try to get you to sign up for an Audible subscription or buy from Blick and all that sort of stuff. Well, listen, this time... I'm not going to do that. This is something different because uh, I've been thinking and actually a couple of people uh, who listen to the podcast have, you know, asked me about this. Um, wouldn't it be cool to have some sculptor's funeral stuff to have lying around your studio? I'm thinking like sculptor's funeral mugs or T-shirts or tote bags or hats or or sculpting aprons or anything like that stuff, you know, merchandise, swag. It would be cool to have a, an official Sculptor's Funeral coffee mug, right? Well, I think so, definitely. But the only problem is, is that I don't really have a logo for the Sculptor's Funeral. You know, I have the, the catchphrase, you know, all the great sculptors are dead and 
all that sort of thing. But graphically, there there isn't a logo, a picture that sort of encapsulates the sculptor's funeral. So here's what I am thinking. You out there, listeners, you design the logo for me, for all of us, really, because I'm absolutely no good at that sort of thing. And um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll collectively pick the best logo and we'll put it up on Redbubble. Redbubble is a website that will print whatever logo you want on whatever you want, mugs, t-shirts, cell phone cases, pillowcases, spiral notebooks, whatever whatever uh, they have on the website, we can get a logo printed right on it, and then we then we buy it. Uh, I'm not going to choose myself. I'm not going to choose a single winner. Uh, I, I might choose up to up to five because I think there's going to be it's going to be likely that several people will make pretty awesome designs. So here's what I'm thinking. Uh, I'll pick up to five different designs and we'll put it up on Redbubble and I'll advertise your designs on the Sculptor's Funeral podcast and on the Facebook page. And then you, the creator of the logo and the podcast, will split the profits 50-50. No one's going to make a lot of money from this, frankly, Um, but it seems fair. So it works out pretty good. Um, You get a little cash as well as a little notoriety for being the individual who designed the Sculptor's Funeral logo. And the Sculptor's Funeral continues to thrive. Uh, And everyone gets awesome mugs and baseball caps and hoodies and whatnot. So what you need to do is if you're interested in helping me design a logo, you need to submit your artwork by posting it onto the Facebook group page of the Sculptor's Funeral so that we can all look at it and check it out and and other people can voice their support for their favorite designs. I am easily swayed by the masses, you know. So, uh, you know, if, you, if there is a logo that you guys really like, you just need to voice your support. You know, click the like button, leave a comment or something like that. Uh, there's no official deadline for getting your logos in, but Christmas is coming. <laughs> and I am out of gift ideas. So I'm thinking the sooner the better. Uh, and as always, guys, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for supporting the Sculptor's Funeral. And the other thing is the narrative aspect of what they're studying. A student is brought into a drawing room here, and on the first day, maybe they're told, or if I was there, I would tell them this. Your eventual goal is to try to achieve the qualities of this model bathed in light. That's their narrative. And you'd say, do you see that? Yeah, I see it. Because it's very obvious when you walk into a drawing room here. When you walk a student into a sculpture room and say, the narrative is so subtle that they, they can't find it. They, they don't even know where to, to look for it. And uh, it's, I think, one of the major things about the narrative being obvious to them in the drawing room is that when I'm introducing a sculptural narrative to them, the goal of their work, uh, which doesn't happen on day one, it's happening throughout a second year, uh, they're used to understanding narrative. They're used to understanding the overall goal can you can you actually explain to me exactly how you're using the word narrative i'm not i'm not sure i'm following well a narrative would be like you know i know what you know what narrative means but the yeah but like a a a class pose in sculpture unless you put the head of medusa in someone's arm is not a narrative it's a contrapposto is the narrative but what what is it about that what is it about the goal of a contrapposto okay uh that what are you looking for what are you trying to achieve and it goes beyond accuracy. And the narrative of a contrapposto, I call it the four windows of the contrapposto, which are how is this model's body type affected by the pose? And it's so subtle. Uh, the more obvious uh, qualities of a model's body type and pose are compression and extension when it comes between the rib cage and the pelvis. But their whole body through tension and relaxation are affected everywhere. Proportions are affected very subtly throughout the pose. Uh, Tense muscles, relaxed muscles. Our narrative is the body itself. And our narrative in sculpture is about how this particular model's body type is affected by the pose they're taking. And that's the narrative in the sculpture room. The narrative could be extremes. I say to a student, like, you know, if, if you had a fairly muscular male model come in here, or female for that matter, and you gave them a 10 pound weight in one hand and a feather in the other hand, their arm, those arms are going to look different. And what we're studying in sculpture are those relative differences. Right. It's an exciting world. And once again, it, if you made an accurate sculpture, you, your sculpture still may not reflect this. So 
Once again, this subtle narrative that I'm asking students to understand, which I think is the expressive quality eventually that they should work with as a sculptor, which is how to appropriately make tension for when it's appropriate, how to balance that through relaxation. That's how painters here are also balancing light and dark. Hmm. You know, if you're not going dark enough with your darks, your lights don't pop out and vice versa. You got to find that range between them. No, so you almost play around with an idea akin to tonal value between tension and relaxation. It's not tonal in sculpture. It's, well, it's, yeah, not, it's but it's more so about the, like, for example, like I would direct a student to be looking at the balanced leg thigh, which is a weight bearing leg. And there'd be more organic contours taking place compared to a stand leg thigh, which is tense and is going to have more geometric patterns in, in it. It's also interesting that in a stand leg thigh, and this is talking about the four windows of a contrapposto, the four windows of a contrapposto are from the pelvis downward that are covering the gluteus and the tops of the thighs, and the pelvis, the two upper windows between them. When you say window, I am, you mean like a sort of a square shape? Or yeah, I'm okay. just imposing the four windows on the model's core of the body. Okay. And I'll point out within those windows this, this, uh, uh, the differences between what's happening to this model's body. So I was saying that the, the balanced leg thigh, upper thigh, is going to have more of an organic, softer contour quality to it than the tension and the more geometric patterns that happen in the weight-bearing leg. Right. This also the way in which proportions are affected in that a balanced leg thigh, which is loose and hanging because it's not tense, is generally going to be wider than this, the stand leg thigh, which when it gets tense and bearing weight, it's going to constrict a little bit. So there's all these very subtle, subtle, subtle things that are happening that, once again, if you just try to look at a model and copy it, you will not find. More obvious examples are the gluteus. The gluteus of a, you know, the, the gluteal fold of the stand leg that you're always going to find there, the length of the gluteus is shorter yeah. this way and that way, whereas the other gluteus muscle is hanging and wider and more open. And then the upper windows of the, of the of these are the compression extension that are happening in the external obliques between the rib cage and the, the pelvic region where there's flatter modeling taking place in the extended area where there's more organic abrupt or there's more ge geometry in the extended side through line quality whereas the other line quality is going to be more organic like the lower windows huh, okay and then the modeling then on the compressed side is going to be more organic and full than the flatter musculature that's going to happen on the extended side. Do you use the term windows uh, because it it sort of gives an opportunity for people for sculptors to see what's going on inside? You're talking about the internality of the of the figure. Is that why you refer to them as windows? The four windows of contraposto? Well, I'm, I'm having them hone in on an area uh -huh. and I'm trying to break it up into different windows. These are concepts that I'm discussing with you that spring up. I don't even know when I first started thinking about these. It probably was five years ago, seven years ago. I don't know why I started using windows. I just, because when you look into a window, you'll isolate the information that's there. Okay. And these, I mean, artistically, personally as well, these are things that I work with myself as a sculptor and try to present them in a more ironic way. You know, and a lot of my work is kind of dealing with subtle little things like this that once again are probably pretty hard for people to understand. Well, actually, yeah, I want to ask you a little bit about your own work because um, you said that it, uh, the narrative of the work here is the body itself. Yeah. And I think that's a fantastic way of phrasing it. I was actually, when I was preparing for this interview, trying to, to sort of sum up, you know, the, the, the kind of work that you do because your, your work is about the body itself. It, it's, it's not... Uh, it's, it's not akin to traditional narrative where you're sculpting a historical character or a religious character or a mythological. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a story. And at the same time, they're not allegories, necessarily. They have allegorical content. But I think, mo I think your work is most akin to some of the stuff that uh, Rodin was doing, you know, in terms of historical context, where he, he was basically the first guy to, to strip the figure from all narrative and identity, you know, just produce... A, a new figure for for what it is, but beyond a study, you know, it's not a study, but it's not an allegory. Things like the Walking Man, mm -hmm. um, where even just you know, of took bronze? off the yeah the age of the age of bronze. Yeah, is is an excellent example. It's, and so we had to rename it because it wasn't going to get exhibited because uh, it wasn't narrative. It, yeah, exactly right, exactly right. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't narrative, and, 
and and it was it was a very difficult thing for people to grasp you know a very sort of confrontational thing to to produce a, a sculpture to produce a figure and not have any sort of uh, real world context no story that it tells no identity there's no name there's no there's no past or future and there's there's just sort of one um, sort of uh, emotive nugget in things like the age of bronze um, that is that, that that exists without context it exists for itself and you know I spent like a half an hour trying to like formulate a succinct way of saying it but you're, you're exactly what you said is you know the, the narrative is the body itself so do you would you say that your work is heavily influenced by Rodin? I've always had a love-hate relationship with Rodin, but uh, I think my work is probably, uh, and it changes, but I, I think Thielman Riemann Schneider is someone who I love because I find that there's the irony exists. And it, it comes from being also in the Renaissance city. I mean, I'm a reactionary in many ways, but I've said, you know, there's a lot of like big like sculptures in Florence of strong men with big muscles. Tillman Riemann Schneider. I'm shocked, actually. I, I didn't well, when know. you look at like St. George, uh, you know, that he had done, it's, it's the horse almost expressionless rearing up. St. George holding the sword almost if it's an afterthought about what he's about to do and he's going to slay the dragon. Mm -hmm. And there's no effort or tension in anything. Whereas someone else may handle that same in the Italian Renaissance, they would have put big muscles on the guy and made it look like a godly act was done through uh, uh, physical force. Mm -hmm. Whereas to me, I like what I react to about Tim and Riemann Schneider's work is the godly act is is happening from things that come from beyond. The, it's not physical strength that's needed to interact with. So even Carbaggio, you know, when uh, Back in 1996, when we went on a school trip to Rome, and we went in to see Carbaggio paintings, and we were looking at young David holding the head of Goliath, and Daniel pointed out, do you see the size of the head? This, And I think you, you'll know the painting, and many of your listeners mm -hmm. will. That In that painting, there's a, a remarkable lack of tension happening in young David's arm holding an enormous head. And that was my first experience with the irony of the body's narrative and how an artist played with it. Mm -hmm. Not to be completely specifically narrative, like the David David's arm has to be tense because it's holding a big head. That this is where I think that the decisions that I make about my work have been influenced. You know, looking at your work, there's there's a through line and, and you've just explained it perfectly. Uh, how I was thinking of it is um, you quite often in your work will show figures that uh, not only are in poses that a, that a model would find impossible to hold for any length of time, mm -hmm. um, but actually poses where they are, they're actually almost structurally, physically impossible. Uh, there's a woman, a new, uh, I think it's called uh, Broke Down Palace, uh -huh. and she's striding forward on basically her ankles. Her feet are twisted up underneath yeah, she's, her. She's just resting delicately on the sides of her foot. Yeah, her yeah, foot. which would be incredibly painful to actually try to do, I think, uh, just because of the weight of the figure above it. But there, there is a, there's a lightness. Uh, the figure is striding in spite of that obvious sort of structural, uh, I guess, irony, you know, the way you, the way you say it. It's, it's, um, another figure is um, your Petrushka. 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 And it looks like he's sort of suspended, hanging from something. Also, uh, the marionette. Mm -hmm. uh, your sculpture, the marionette. These are all marionettes in a certain way. All yeah, well, actually, it's funny. I, I uh, saw the title of one of your works, The Marionette, and I assumed it was, it was uh, the guy with his arms up, but it's actually the, the female figure who looks like she's sort of suspended, and it almost seems as though the part of her foot, I think, again, it's on the sort of the side of the foot. It's not uh, flat-footed on the ground. It's just sort of brushing the ground yeah. as if she's suspended. Um, yeah, and all these works were, were uh, marionettes, Without them being called marionette number one, marionette number two, marionette number three. Right, right. You know, was that where you're going for this? Uh, the irony of of, uh, of these poses, of the the tension and relaxation. I don't know if that was the, the the thought back then. The works may have represented it, but these though all that series of works were, I think, more for me personally, artistically, were breaking from, I think, what I was capable of at the time, which is I I relied on models being in position. 
And there came a need for me to make the first marionette, which was Petrushka, uh, based on life events, that sculpture presented itself and needed to be a certain way. And I could almost see it in my head before I made it. And despite the fact this model did a remarkable job in taking that pose fairly well, uh, this is where then, you know, relying on this strict sort of a model needs to stand in position in order for me to be able to make it. So that's where I started to evolve, I think, as a sculptor. That's, I think, what those works represent. The ideas behind them were, you know, that there's something guiding their movements that aren't themselves, so as a marionette would. So there, there's probably a lot of irony in what's going on in those, in those works. I think the idea of the specific narrative that I'm discussing with you is it's been it's a little bit more of a recent uh, sort of concept that I realized I need to discuss in the studio. When I find a student is sitting there trying to copy, I know that they're going to get it wrong, no matter how well they're copying. And I, I try to teach people to know what to look for. And that's another experience that happens here over three years. People don't, in the beginning don't know what to look for, and they're just trying to make it. And I find if, if you're just copying, it's like you look at an arm and try to look at the arm of your sculpture, it's like playing Where's Waldo. So I'm trying to direct them into being what I call an aggressive observer, which is different than I would call someone who's like looking at their subject and then looking at their work as a means to copy a passive observer, that they're you know grazing, looking between the two trying to find the differences that they need to improve, where I'm trying to teach, direct my students into, once again, knowing what to look for. And when you know what to look for, you need to have a narrative that helps guide them, that, that when it's subtle, you can point it out, and they're like, oh, wow, you know, this is really interesting. Wow, I never really would have thought that. So then in my more recent works, the, the, the idea of irony is playing more of a role as I became more aware of it, because it's not like, you know, as this sculpture program evolves, as I evolve, as I work with students, once again, I wasn't discussing these things seven years ago. I did a karyatid sculpture, which I think when we had an open studio, you saw. Yeah. It's coming back here on bronze, actually, pretty soon. But it's an unbearable weight that is being supported by a f somewhat fragile female who is not buckling or suffering by having to support that weight. And that's where the irony plays a, a big role in that piece itself and it's it's very subtle and it, it's not it's something that unless you're really interested in, in my work and looking at it uh, you're not going to get the unfortunate part of the subtlety I think that's taking place in my works is that it's it's hard to understand uh, unless you're a figurative sculptor or really passionate of, you know about figurative sculpture and I remember when I was making that sculpture, you know, a lot of what, whether it was students or people coming through the studio, I remember a group from Australia made an appointment to come and see me. And this man looks at the sculpture, and he keeps looking at the sculpture, and he keeps looking at the sculpture, and he goes, he looks at me and he goes, it's not described very well that she has tension in her body that is supporting this weight above her. But he said it in a critical term. And I said, thank you for being the first person to see that and it's totally intentional what was his response to that he i think was happy to know that there's an artistic interpretation going on here mm. you know i'm a little I, I i'm not a big fan of narrative works like you know uh there's the wonderful narrative works in the history of art but you know the i think being overly narrative often and which is leading me to being very subtle in my work where it's hard to even understand what's going on is because, I, you know, I think art, if anything, is a mystery. and I, I like it to be there. And if something is given to me, like, here's this painting and it's this happening here at this moment in time, it's, it's like, okay, I get it. And I will look at it if it's well painted or not, but not that interested in the, what it's showing me. So the, the, the painting and drawing uh, program here at FAA, as you mentioned, is, is heavily rooted in 19th century technique um, and necessarily sort of French technique, sort of the Col de Beaux-Arts and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the ateliers of, of the Parisian milieu of the 19th century. Um, and here it is in Florence. 
And your work itself actually involved, you know, evolved, you know, drawing in space, evolved from sort of the, the, the box and egg sort of thing, which I believe is actually an American phenomenon. It's, a, it's an early 20th century thing. They weren't teaching box and egg in, in, in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. And here we are in Renaissance Florence. And I'm just wondering, obviously, I think, I think Florence Academy could, could be, you know, kind of anywhere uh, in terms of what, what, what it teaches. Uh, and in fact, it is. It's, it's got a branch. Yeah, I was in, say. It's got a branch in Sweden. It's got a branch in New York. Um, what what is what is living in Florence uh, offer um, the your, your own work? How does how does it, how does living in Florence influence your work, or does it? Um, you mentioned that your work is sort of uh, largely devoid of traditional narrative, and of course, that's all you're going to find in Florence. Yeah, I. I... Never wanted to be Michelangelo, but admire him probably more than most artists. Uh, I think coming to Italy uh, influenced my work a great deal back in 1996, back when I was thinking to pursue abstraction. Abstraction was what I admired about it then is that you weren't, it was not narrative, like we're discussing now, and that people can interpret it in, in varieties of ways. When I came, when I moved to Italy and I couldn't speak the language and I had to go places and describe what I needed and was unable to do this language the language started playing a role in my daily activity that was frustrating uh, that I couldn't communicate and you know I've never experienced that in my life so I, I kept thinking to myself well if my work if I'm an artist that's hoping to communicate to people my thought was that the figure should be my chosen subject if my hope was to ever communicate things to others. So living in Italy, I always admired Michelangelo, of course, but I, the living in Italy influenced the direction that my work took. Just thinking more about uh, communication in yeah. general because of the struggles of the language. I thought at 20 years old that that's what an artist should probably be doing is communicating, but... Uh, you know, that all changes and things may become full circle where I'm talking to you about maybe my, my work as a narrative in the hopes that in some cases that people can interpret it in varieties of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That also came from influences of my teacher. I remember her work always was kind of about the same thing, uh, nature and its spectacular irregularities. And when you talk to her about her work, every piece seemed to be about that. And very hyper-realistic figures were displaying this. And she had an ex exhibition once over the summer, and I first day of school, I saw her and I said, oh, how did that exhibition go you were preparing for? And she goes, oh, it went great. A lot of people attended, uh, and there was all these potential sales. And I said, oh, well, that's great. You know, I was really happy for her. And I said, well, so I said, did you sell a bunch of work? She goes, actually, I didn't sell anything. And I said, really? I said, what, why don't you think that happened? He goes, because I told everyone what my work meant to me. How did that... Uh... If you tell so, I, I'm pretty careful about telling people about what my work is about, in that I, I wouldn't want it to become to someone only what I think about it. I see. I see. Because, you know, it's like that, those illusions, the visual illusions of like, do you see the man's head in the orange? No, I don't. And then you point out where you see it, and then you can't see the orange anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think art, uh, how people interpret it and what people what it means to them, how, how meaningful it could be to them, needs to be left to the appreciator right. of that, not need, the maker. Yeah, it kills the mystery. And one of the, I think when I was in graduate school, I went to a Louise Bourgeois uh, exhibition at MIT, and it was an assignment that we had to do as graduates since we had to go there and go through this work, and it, they had the big spider there, which was mm. kind of scary. But So throughout this exhibition that I was required to go and sort of you know, indulge in was... Uh, her sketchbook and it was like stick figures you know doing things that were unrecognizable so what accompanied every single drawing was a paragraph or two if not a full page of writing by her telling this is what's happening so you went up to these drawings and the drawings to be perfectly honest for me weren't that interesting to look at so in order to be a good student well i might as well just have to read this paragraph or two so i just went around this exhibition i wasn't even really looking at the drawings i was just looking at reading <laughs> thinking defeating the purpose of of what the work is already but I got to one and it just said there's like a line and it said sometimes a mystery is more interesting I'll leave this one a mystery and that was the most interesting thing in the whole exhibition was thank was the, you for that was the drawing interesting or just no. the thought 
of the whatever it meant to her she wanted it to remain a mystery and i i was affected by that probably also because i think that she needed one of those drawings to 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 say that about one of these drawings not describe it in full to everyone about her thoughts and why the marks on these pages were done the way they were a lot of the ways you um play with uh uh sort of seeming weightlessness in your figures uh and uh, how, how you choose to um, attach them to their, their bases, um, whether it's just you know, the, the plinth that a figure is almost barely standing on or, or with your figure feline, uh, where, where it's, it's a fairly cantilevered figure uh, coming out of a uh, sort of a, I guess, kind of a sculpted cloud is what it looks like to me. Um, it reminds me a lot of Gary Weissman. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you're familiar with his work. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Is, is he an influence on your work? I see really, really... I think Gary Weissman is one of the most exciting contemporary figure of sculptors there is. And he's been at it a long time. I mean, it's... Uh, I, I... I don't look at Gary's work and try to glean ideas. Uh, I remember first seeing Gary's work uh, seven, eight years ago, maybe. Uh, and seeing torsos in John Pence's gallery, looking on John Pence's website. His more recent work, yes, and I think in some ways is very similar in that there, and even more so today, if you've seen some of what he's doing, there's a lot of playfulness and uh, the poses are becoming more extreme in his work as well. Uh, I see in a lot of people's work. I see a lot of uh, people trying to push uh, gesture and, and movement within their sculpture. You know, Facebook is just an interesting, you know, you get, I get inundated with sculpture, 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 sculpture all the time. And uh, I see a lot of people pushing pose today. And I, uh, I think it's a very exciting time to be a figurative sculptor because I think there's so many good people out there doing it. And I think they're doing it in an interesting way. And I think they're doing it in a unique way. And Gary Weissman, I admire a great deal. And I, he's one of, to me, you know, like I said, one of the top figurative sculptors that are working today. So where do you think your work is going? Do you have anything uh, under yes uh, under construction right now? I do. What's in my new, my new model stand here, I had my model in for the first time uh, a couple days ago. And I, I work in varieties of ways. Sometimes I was mentioning Petrushka as a sculpture I, I saw in my head before I made it. And that, you know, in some cases that's really nice because the making of it becomes a lot easier. <laughs> Uh, if you can capture that visual image, which is some, it's not the easiest thing in the world. And sometimes I, I come through my work through uh, a completely different act in that I'm not quite sure exactly what the, the sculpture needs to be uh, and work with a model. That's how Feline was born. And I, my mind has not been on myself and my work over a period of many months here now from getting this new program or the new school taken care of but my model was available and I said, well, come in, you know, we'll just try to do some things and it didn't take long, but I wanted to continue with, you know, the irony of weight uh, that I've been exploring in my work. Uh, and I had a, some inklings of ideas of types of karyotids that the first karyotid I did, even though there's that irony to it, it, it it's a little bit more reminiscent of a karyotid instead of maybe how I would like to interpret a karyotid. Yeah. So uh, the the new sculpture, which that I'll be starting here next week now, is going to be a little bit larger than I've been working. I've been working about half scale now for a few years, and I've enjoyed that. But this sculpture, uh, as I began working on the pose and seeing what it could become, started also getting larger as I was sitting here that day. So it's going to be a larger scale and... You know, uh, I don't like to talk too much about a sculpture before I make it. All I can tell everyone listening out there is I'm really excited about it. Well, Robert Bodum, thank you so much for uh, for talking to me today. I really do appreciate it. You're welcome, and Jason. I was hoping you were going to ask me how I was doing when we started because I was going to... <laughs> I wasn't actually going to end the interview there, but I just thought it was a nice uh, sort of segue, you know talking about you know the future I, good. I love the introduction to your the, the podcast that we're broadcasting from Florence 
where all the great sculptors are dead and I'm not feeling so well myself. I had this idea if you were to say, so Rob, how are you doing today? I was going to say, well, Jason, I'm not feeling so well myself. Oh, I missed that opportunity. I'm sorry. You know, that was my one preparation for the interview. I to say that. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and a big thanks to Robert Bodum for the insightful interview. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, don't forget to check out additional content at the Sculptor's Funeral YouTube channel or on our Facebook group page as well. And while you're there, you can join in the conversation, ask a question, leave a comment about the podcast or about sculpture in general. You can post current events and more. There are professional sculptors from around the world who are active on the Facebook page, people sculpting in every medium from marble to digital, making everything from monumental figures to movie monsters to coin currency. So, so if you have a sculpture question you've always wanted the answer to, chances are good that if you ask the question at the Facebook group page, someone there will have the answer. And also don't forget to get cracking on your logo designs for the sculptor's funeral. Post those also to the Facebook group page. You can also subscribe to the podcast at Stitcher Mobile or on iTunes or subscribe from any service from which you get your podcasts. And you can receive the podcast automatically downloaded to your PC, tablet, or mobile every week. And if you want to help the podcast reach other people like you, leave a review of the podcast or give the podcast a rating at iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you subscribe. Check out the SculptorsFuneral.com website as well, where you can stream the complete archives of the show. You can check out the image galleries for this and for every episode. And finally, if you feel so inclined, you can click on the sponsor of the podcast, Blick Art Supplies, while you're there. Clicking on the link and buying from Blick helps to support the podcast, and for that, I thank you. Thanks again for listening, and have a productive week.